Welcome to this Stanford's Travel Writers Festival event. Telling us why geography matters, I'm delighted to introduce Nicholas Crane in conversation with Julia Wheeler. Hello and welcome to the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival to this session. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming on the journey with us in this extraordinary year. It's my absolute pleasure and delight to welcome back to Stanford's one of our very favourite authors, somebody who's been up there on the stage in the corner of Olympia on many an occasion. Um, and I'm delighted to say that he's joining us from his home now. Nick Crane, welcome back. Hello, Julia. Lovely to see you and to be with Stanford again. We're going to be talking about all sorts of things. I don't know where this conversation will roam, but I know that it will be fascinating. I'd like to start with your book, uh, Why Geography Matters, the title of that book, Why Geography Matters. And you say um, that the main premise of this is that the great age of geography is now upon us. How so? Well, um, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep the answer concise because in many ways we've always been in a great age of geography but what I mean by that is that we've reached that point in the human occupation of the planet where we really have to take geography on board as the subject that will define our futures. One of the, the many uh, definitions of geography is uh, interconnectedness, the idea that parts of our planet, both, both human and physical, are all interconnected and that there are effects, that knock-on effects. Um, uh, if, if you interfere with one part of, 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 of the planet, there will be uh, implications in other parts. Um, and you can see that with uh, the water cycle, which is uh, one of the four main cycles uh, of, of the planet and, and the way that if you imagine um, a water droplet evaporating from the ocean being carried uh, inland and then condensing, for example, in clouds over mountains and then falling as rain or snow, then flowing down mountain streams and then rivers into estuaries and back into the ocean. You can see that at any one point in that cycle, a water droplet can be interfered with and it could be it could be pollution while it's in the waters. It could be coastal sea defences when it's, be, it's being rammed up against the land in storms. Um, every single part of the planet is, is connected to other parts. And we've reached that point where there are so many of us living on the planet and exacting so many demands upon it that the future has become rather critical. Um, and the more of us that understand the way basic geography works, uh, the easier we're going to find it to adapt to the changes that are already in the pipeline. The phrase tipping point comes to mind in what you've just been saying, and we're often hearing, almost continually hearing about um, we're reaching a tipping point. If we go beyond this, we won't be able to pull back and so on and so forth. There are plenty of warnings are we fatigued by those warnings? And is that why it sometimes feels difficult to take any action? That's such a good question, Julia. And I think just the two words tipping point are a part of the problem. Once we start thinking uh, in too fateful a way about tipping points, there's a, there's a temptation to give up, just to think, well, that's, that we can't get past that tipping point. There is no future. Um, and um, uh, we have always, as human beings, had to live with tipping points. They're nothing new. For example, there's a, there's, there's a, a little known but rather fascinating Mesolithic hunter-gatherer site in the south of Wales on the coast uh, where archaeologists have discovered that uh, in a midden containing uh, the, the shells of... of, uh, of, of um, sea creatures they were harvesting from the intertidal zone, that the shells were getting smaller and smaller the further up the midden, the rubbish heap, they came. So basically the hunter-gatherers consumed all of the food they could on that section of the coast until the animals were too small to eat, then they moved on somewhere else. So in, they reached their own local tipping point there, and that was thousands of years ago. So we've always 
harvested and extracted more than was supportable. The trick now, and it goes back to your question about why geography matters and the great age of geography, is that we simply have now to live within our means. It's completely essential. Um, but to answer your question, and I don't think tipping points are massively helpful as a as a as a headline to live with because of what you've just said. It, it encourages the idea that it's too late to do anything, um, whereas it's not. And, and what we have to do is adapt. We have to find a way through 1.5 degrees, for example, of climate change, global warming, through to perhaps two two degrees, which is very serious. And the UN reckons the difference between 1.5 degrees centigrade and two degrees centigrade of of global warming will be hundreds of millions of people put into poverty, uh, which is truly appalling. So to bring it down from that grand idea of the tipping point and the, the sort of the good versus evil, my feeling is that it has to be on a more local level. People have to understand that what they do today has an effect tomorrow. So I wonder whether, um, actually to come back to the, the the word tipping point you remember is it Malcolm Gladwell who wrote the tipping point that um, the behavioral economics side of things I wonder whether there's a there's an argument for geographers teaming up with behavioral economists to nudge people into doing the right thing whether that's in terms of what they eat the way they travel um, so that we feel that we have a control more of a control over it yeah, that's a really good point, and and I, you know, the, the, a very good example of a geographer who is engaging on the front line would be um, Mark Maslin, who wrote um, co-wrote with Simon Lewis a book on the Anthropocene, and uh, and Mark put out on his Twitter account, I forget exactly one, at some point in the last couple of years, a kind of a nine-point hit list of things we can do in our own homes. Um, I, 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 it's kind of an empowering list. And actually, I, I jotted them down. Um, and uh, so he says, talk about it. And this is with reference to climate change. Talk about it. Switch to a more vegetarian or vegan diet. Switch to renewable energy. Reduce, reuse and recycle more. Use an electric or hybrid car if you can afford it. Stop flying or if you really have to, then offset. Divest from fossil fuels. Protest, uh, protest and vote. Um, to, to his list of nine, I would add an and understand basic geography. Um, so there you got you know, nine or ten you know, points on an action plan for your own kitchen. And, uh, and I think understanding basic geography is, is, is not a big deal. You know, we're talking about year six primary level, which is where it's now taught um, in, in good primary schools in this country. Um, and if you get it at year six primary level as an adult, and even better if you can get it at GCSE level, then you've got it. You really, you really have grasped the essentials, the interconnectedness, the links between human and physical geography, the relationships between cities and countryside, the value of biodiversity. You understand just enough of the science behind David Attenborough's programmes to understand why species matter. Um, so it's it's it need, we're not talking about having to having to do a degree in geography or further. We're talking about just the very basic primary and secondary levels. I wonder how happy you are with the geography curriculum on that basis, because it strikes me that when we're seven or eight or even younger, we're actually engaging with geography. We're out there in the forest. We're down at a beach. We're diverting streams or jumping in puddles or whatever it is, and we've got that very visceral connection with basically what a lot of geography is but then from that year six onwards there is a, a drop off in interest um, to GCSE certainly to A level or IB and then on to degree level so do you see that there's potentially an issue with the curriculum in terms of engaging people or is it just that people have to make choices? I, I'm you know, I, I wouldn't dare trespass into um, the world, world of formal education and, and, and start nitpicking about the curriculum because my own, my own interactions with it would suggest that, that, that now that climate change, um, biodiversity and so on are being incorporated in, in state school curriculum in, in Britain, that we're, 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 we're there. Um, and you couldn't possibly fault the dedication of 
modern teaching staff. I mean, every if you want to be uplifted, go into any any modern school. Um, it's it's you know it's impossible to walk out without feeling that you've you've met truly astonishing, committed people. I do think that um, a huge issue, a really huge issue, is funding for for education. It simply has to be increased. It is the most important field of of intellectual endeavour by far, the education of young people. And um, uh, among the elements of, of geographical education, which I think have fallen by the wayside, uh, is, is fieldwork. Um, and it is completely critical. And I don't mean expensive um, geographical cruises around the Mediterranean or, or field trips to the, to the Himalayas. I mean, just going out into your own neighbourhood with uh, with a geography teacher who can explain what you're looking at. And actually, given that uh, well more than half of the world's population now live in cities, we're not talking necessarily about the countryside. You, you learn a vast amount walking around your own streets and just looking. But if, you, if, if somebody is there to explain to you how the various components of your own neighbourhood are interacting, it'll make a lot more sense. There's a very famous uh, New York um, educationist called Lucy Sprague Mitchell, who is teaching young uh, New Yorkers uh, 100 years ago. And she reckoned that, uh, you know, the, the, that the Manhattan intersection, the crossroads, is one of the most important places in the world to learn, learn geography. And she's completely right. Um, so I think funding, funding and encouragement of field work make a big difference because that's the bit when geography comes alive, isn't it? You know, when you're actually out there in the air with your feet on different types of surface, um, whether you're standing in a glaciated valley in the Lake District or standing between the canyons of high rise in the city, um, it's actually there around you. I was just thinking back to my A-level field trips down um, in Swanage and Studland Bay and Durdledore, and that's really what, what stays with you. Tell us about what, which particular field trips stay with you from your studies. Um, I, I was at a, a not very well off state school, so our, our, in Norfolk our field trips uh, were very limited. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I think I might have gone to Cromer once. <laughs> Um, but actually, um, as you know, I, 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 I'm doing them a disservice. We, we, we went the whole way to Dartmoor um, to, uh, and actually the, the erosion of Dartmoor's granite tours has stayed with me ever since. I did, despite the fact that somehow Cider got involved on a field trip, I remembered enough from it to, for it to help construct um, my knowledge of physical geography. But actually my... I was very lucky. My school teacher uh, at the school I was at, Mr. Roger Noble, who I, I went back to see him not long ago, he's retired now, of course, but he, he changed my life. Um, but he changed it within the classroom. And this was in the days of you know, blackboards and chalk. Um, and I can still see him standing uh, beside the blackboard, drawing um, Yardangs and Zeugen. And only those who are interested in the different shapes of uh, Sahara and sand dunes would would know exactly what they are, but I was utterly, utterly mesmerized. Um, and for me, the shapes of those crescentic sand dunes on a Norfolk classroom wall were just transporting. I and mean, we didn't have a television at the time, so that he was my David Attenborough. I could actually, I could hear the, the sand grains whistling over the sand dunes as he was describing them. It was very real. Uh, he was completely brilliant, and actually, Mr. Noble um, was was responsible more than anybody for uh, for getting me into geography. It's that teacher, isn't it, that just creates the curiosity in you, and and curiosity really is is the the geographer's emotion, the geographer's drive, almost. Yeah, so that, that's so right. Uh, it's it's uh, it's odd, isn't it? I think. Um, where does curiosity come from? It's very interesting. Where, do, where does it come from? Why do we have it? Um, I think it has to occupy a vacuum in our imaginations. Perhaps, per, perhaps you can only really mobilise your own curiosity if you've got a space into which it can operate. And, um, uh, and perhaps that means, and I'm you know, the world's worst example of somebody who's kind of ho hovering around on trying to do too many things at once. But um, if, you, if you go for a walk, 
um, and you haven't taken any headphones with you and you've just got the sounds of the space that you're moving through uh, to work with, then your curiosity will take off. You know, you'll start thinking about, you know, why the clouds are that shape to why this footpath you're following crosses the, you know, somebody's, you know, in, in this extraordinary lockdown, and I'm speaking to you from central London, so my open space is the park. And it's quite fascinating the way desire paths have sprung up all over what a year ago was grass, green, just, just blank grass. And it's because individuals, groups are starting to find ways of, of avoiding each other by walking on the tarmac paths. And it's absolutely fascinating because it's almost like having a, a bit, being a witness to Mesolithic hunter-gatherers because what you're watching are lots of people repeatedly following routes that they've devised for themselves. And, and I look at some, I think, why, why, why is that one going over there? And is, is it because when you come into the park, you're confronted by people walking towards you down a tarmac path and you can see two trees at 30 degrees to left and the trees kind of get your eye and so you head towards them. And then other people start doing this and suddenly you've got this new dirt path running across London Park. Um, and of course that's, you know, back, back, it, back in the day, 10,000 years ago, when hunter-gatherers first moved over the land bridge to what's now Britain, um, that was the beginning of, of, of footpaths that became B roads, that became A roads, that became motorways. That was how the infrastructure of Britain developed, but by individuals making, uh, fulfilling their curiosity to go and look around the next corner or to try a new route. That description that you, you make of the park is, um, I mean, it's a kind of microcosm really of human adaptability, isn't it? And you say that this is why we are the successful species that we are. Yes, I mean, we, we have to have faith in our own ability to adapt, don't we? Given the challenge that we've got ahead of us. And, you know, just look at the last 12 months, absolutely unbelievable. Who would have guessed five years ago that we'd be adapting to a global pandemic in the way that we have? Um, and I think we've, you know, when we stand back from it in years to come, we'll be really surprised at what we achieved. And uh, uh, the toll has been truly terrible. The human toll has been truly terrible. And um, uh, as, as will the forecast toll with climate change be truly terrible, it's, 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 it's an appalling prospect. Um, but if we can mobilise the same... Uh, ambitions of, of adaptation and of behavioral change to, to climate, we're going to be able to navigate a way through it, um, or most of us are, but it will need a, a, a huge reversioning of ways of living that we've come to take for granted. Mm. I mean, we've come to the, we've been hearing it over and over again, um, we're listening to the science, we're listening to the science. It's wonderful to have that science out there but I wonder how much we rely on it in our minds thinking someone will come up with a solution the engineers will come up with a solution the physicists the chemists the biologists will come up with a solution and how um how much geographers have a seat at that table mm. wow that's that's a really good and tricky question um uh, certainly a far more influential seat than they did 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and um, among the, in fact, I, you know, I would argue the organisation that has, has done the most to embed geographers in policymaking is the Royal Geographical Society, who uh, several years ago uh, set up a, a unit that now is several thousand strong of geographers within government. This is an interdepartmental group of people with geographical backgrounds who are able to communicate with each other, get together once a year, um, to share their, the, their own geographical insights into their particular areas of operation. And this is it's long overdue, um, because as I've argued in, 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 in my little book, Why Geography Matters, um, uh, geography as much as anything is a way of thinking. Um, and if, if we go on running communities and countries as if they can be administered in completely self-standing silos, it's, it's all going to come to a rather ugly end because these silos are not self-standing, they're all interdependent. 
Um, and we have to understand that, uh, take one example, HS2, the, you know, the HS2 argument is, is incredibly complicated, or the, the tunnel at Stonehenge. Um, personally, a tr I think it's a truly appalling idea. Um, you know, why, why, are we, why, are we, why are we building a tunnel under the most famous Mesolithic stroke, Neolithic archaeological site um, in Britain, indeed in Europe, um, at a time when car use has simply got to decline. You know, your, your motor cars are not the future. They've only been around for 100 years, after all, you know, and we've been living continuously in Britain for 12,000 years. What's the big deal with these independent metal boxes that have only been around for 100 years? Why do we have to adapt the entire landscape for them? It's completely bonkers. Completely bonkers. Sorry, I've calmed down. <laughs> I, I can see that you, with the background, that you are also um, walking the walk, or rather cycling the, cycling the talk, shall we say? Um, you, you, um, you, you're not just talking about it. You are actually kind of living, living that as well. Um, so geographers are are there in government, which is great because it means then that you that they are able to kind of hold people to account with that hat on. Um, and I wonder, thinking about holding people to account and actually action coming out of talk, what your thoughts are and hopes and your realistic hopes for um, COP26 are later this year? What would you like to see come out of that and what do you realistically think will? Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I've had my head down um, writing a book for the last 12 months. So I'm, I'm slightly out of the current thinking, um, but I will be engaging with it in the next four weeks when, once I've delivered, delivered this book. But um, I, mean, I think the most important thing to come out of, out of, out of COP is, is uh, I mean, it, it would be, a, if you like, a fantasy, but it is to come up with a global Green New Deal uh, that, that uh, of, of the kind that, Naomi Klein uh, has written about that that caps um, consumption and uh, and CO two emissions at such a level that we're not simply going to bust straight through two degrees centigrade and uh, land hundreds of millions of people in in poverty or worse. I mean, I, I think there's a if the same kind of global effort can be mobilized at COP, as has been mobilized in the last 12 months to deal with this global pandemic, then we could be, it'll, it'll be the first time since the 70s that my inner soul starts to feel cheery um, about the future of the planet. I've got, I've got books upstairs um, in my sort of climate change shelf dating from 1974-5, one of them by the United Nations, uh, uh, warning that's called Only One Earth and is written by two scientists who had been on a, at, at a UN conference and they warned that um, any global temperature increases of, of more than two degrees would uh, lead to catastrophic consequences but that was that was the early 1970s uh, and we've we've frittered away 50 years literally frittered away 50 years so um, if if the approach of COP can be um, can be prepared for as if we can see an approaching global pandemic, then, then we'll get somewhere um, because it does need a global response. And I, I really, really hope that, that the UK can, can take the lead with this in a really courageous way. Um, uh, and um, because after all, I, I think, I think, you know, the, the UK, the UK led the way, led the way for the world into industrial revolutions. Um, we more than any other nation showed how to consume fossil fuels uh, at scale. And I think in a sense, if you look at the kind of global story, we're slightly beholden to, to lead the world into a post fossil fuel um, existence, sustainable existence. It would be something that would make many of us in the UK walk very tall uh, to lead the way. Um, and I think it would be a unifying strategy, uh, something that we can all buy into within the country. 
Um, and it's something that our children can obviously believe in too. It's their world. The optics for that look fantastic, but um, you, me, many of the people watching will know that sometimes you um, are involved in organisations where there is the best intention and there's a lot of talk, but things kind of get kicked down the road. And so I wonder whether the, the difficulty of the comparison with the pandemic is that the pandemic affects us this hour, this day, this week, and people that we know and love today. Whereas when we're looking at a much longer span, a longer term goal, we're looking at um, net zero carbon by 2050, it seems so way off um, that it's difficult, almost in the human consciousness to kind of gather ourselves around that and to um, have purpose with it. Yeah, and I think I think the issue is, is a, a, a one and, and one way of addressing that is to think about the the benef beneficial spin offs uh, that we can enjoy by addressing acute climate change. Um, and the most obvious one would be a reduction in pollution. Um, if we use cars and planes less, the air we breathe will become cleaner. Our quality of life will actually go up. Um, it doesn't all have to be sacrifice. Um, in fact, I, I would argue that uh, every aspect of addressing climate change will lead to um, uh, a higher quality of life for all of us, both individually and, and collectively. It's, um, so I don't see it as being, being a qualitative cost to address climate change. Um, it's certainly a massive adjustment, um, but we've all had to massively adjust this year. We know how to do that. In terms of, of kind of the, 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 the sort of temporal horizon, the idea that, that you, 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 you talked about, which is that it's, it's more difficult to think urgently about something that always seems to have uh, a, a distant horizon 2030 the, the, the one at the end of the century is the one that annoys me more than anything as if you know so, somehow nothing happens after the end of the century well for those who have children you know that'll be the age of our grandchildren they'll be living through that time they don't they don't they, what does it sound like to an eight-year-old to hear people in their 60s talking about the end of the century as if it doesn't matter what happens after that. It's it's insulting to young people, and um, so that that I, we 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 have to stop that. And and you know, I, 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 there's been an incredible change in approach in the last two or three years. Look, the BBC only only I think it was last year first started putting climate crisis strap lines on on uh, news broadcasts. Climate crisis. Well, that's very, that's new. When I was recording Coast. Um, we were not really allowed to talk about climate change without having what I saw as the opposing view, denying view, which, which was maddening. Um, and, um, uh, but that has all changed. And the, the, the language of, of climate change is, is, is much more current. It's with us all the time. And I think that also the other thing is that whether we like it or not, we're now, we've now moved into um, a global era where the implications of climate change are actually a daily occurrence. So they're not, it's, it's, it, we don't have to look to 20, 30, 40 or 50 or the end of the century to, to witness a climate event. Nearly every day there's a climate event now. And one of the brilliant things, for example, about that, have a, you know, I urge everybody to look at the Met Office website. They have a very, you know, we think of the Met Office, the British Met Office as being, you know, where you go and look at the forecast and find out whether you should go for a bike ride or a picnic tomorrow or not. Actually, they've got a very good climate change section. And if you start looking at the Met Office website, you'll see that actually there are many, many events now, um, perhaps even the, the, the cold snap that's covering the north of England in snow at the moment that are attributable to a warming climate, uh, moving jet streams, speeding up jet streams, sudden shifts and so on. Um, there's all sorts of things happening. You could even argue, and, and some are, that actually, you know, we're, we're beyond, we've now moved beyond the age of weather being like a natural phenomenon. And it's now, it's all, it's all being climate tweaked. It's always been climate tweaked, but I mean, I mean, uh, uh, tweaked by humankind. 
Um, let's talk maps, Nick, because this is Stanford's. It would be rude not to talk maps, really. Um, and it would be wonderful if we might start um, with Makita, who I know is a, a particular hero of yours. Yeah, he Makita saw himself as a geographer and uh, he lived in the uh, actually through most of the 1500s, he had, lived into his 80s. Um, he was born in 1512 in what is now Flanders and the Low Countries, a very flat, a, a part of Europe as flat as a map, which I don't think is coincidental that he, that he then became what, to my mind, is, is the world's greatest map maker. He, what, what, I, I, I became very uh, absorbed by his life and his achievements and his character. He was, to my mind, he was the perfect geographer. He lived in an age of great tumult uh, during the religious reformation when Europe was polarized between Lutherans and Catholics and he refused to align himself with either extreme. He was an anti-extremist. He, he, he occupied the most dangerous place of all, the middle, the no, the, the, the no man's land between the two extremes. And so he was persecuted by both, particularly the Catholics. He was locked up by the Spanish Inquisition. But through all of this, he, he believed that describing the world's geography would bring people together, that it would be a harmonizing activity. Uh, it was a beautiful life lived, you know, and... Um, he, uh, he he's known for his maps, but he wrote he, he tried to write a history of the cosmos. Um, not surprisingly, he died before it's finished. But um, but he's he's he, what he's really well known for is what he called his modern maps. Uh, he produced over a hundred of them um, of the world, and they were although he didn't travel himself, he never really left the Low Countries in northern Germany. Um, he he assembled his cartographic material from ships captains navigators he used to go to the uh, frankfurt book fair every year uh, to buy manuscript maps manuscript versions of marco polo and so on they bring them all back home to either when he was in the netherlands in the low countries to uh, to um uh, his home there or to duisburg in germany when he, where he lived and then he would, he would editorialize all this geographic information into his modern maps and, and the interesting thing about his modern maps were that they were not, unlike medieval maps, they were not covered in sea monsters and ships and conjectural Edens and this kind of thing. They were mathematical. They were immediately recognisable as, as a sort of prototype ordnance survey map. They, they carried the features that you expect to see on the map, the towns, the villages, the mountains, the rivers, the coasts. And um, where possible, he used geographical information that had been uh, produced by surveying, because this was the beginning of triangulation, uh, mathematical surveying, and he was a great proponent of it. And then he, his kind, if you like, his, his tour de force was the binding of all of these modern maps, 110, 115 of them or so, into a book that he called Atlas. And it was the first time that a book of maps had been called Atlas. And so he, he coined a term that we now use as a common noun, uh, an atlas. And um, uh, he's very modest. Uh, he, he, he never sought fame. Uh, and uh, he just, he was devoted to describing the planet. He was, to my mind, the perfect geographer. He, he was clearly utterly fascinated by the way the world worked, both its human and physical dimensions. And he wanted to harmonize the whole. He saw the globe as this very beautiful um, element of creation, or the element of creation. And how much did he, like so many of us human beings, put himself or his part of the world in the centre of the map and look out? Yeah. Um, well, I think I know what you're heading towards there, Julia. So Mercator's projection, um, which is, if you like, along with the Atlas, is probably, probably better known for Mercator's projection because if you look at the bottom of many uh, modern maps, including the NASA website. If you look at NASA website, you'll see that much of the solar system has been mapped on something called Mercator's projection. Uh, there are many different types of projection, uh, and a projection is the means of, if you like, flattening a spherical globe into a two-dimensional map. So it's flattening three dimensions to two dimensions. But of course, if you do that, you're going to get distortion on the two-dimensional version because of stretching or gaps. And um, so Mercator, he came up with his projection because 
he wanted to devise a projection that allowed a compass bearing to remain the same whether you stood on the surface of the curved globe, for example, on the deck of a ship, or whether you were standing with that compass resting on a two-dimensional flat map. He wanted to create the, if you like, the, the, the perfect projection that allowed that compass frame to be the same. Because if he could do that, he realised that, for example, a seafarer could decide to set off from a place at 283 degrees, set the compass, and then go out onto the deck of a ship set the compass to 283 and it would take him to the place that the map said it would do. And until his projection, that was not possible. It was, it's a work of complete genius. Now, unfortunately, what happened is that the diagram he drew to explain how his projection worked showed the world flattened in two dimensions with Europe right in the middle. And forever after he's been accused of creating a Eurocentric world map. But he's been accused by people who don't read the legend on his map, which says that it's an aid for navigation. It's not a political description of the world. It's just an aid to navigation. But, you know, when I was at school, you could, I, I've got my school at a few feet away. You know, you open it and the, and the world map is on Mercator projection with Europe slap bang in the middle. And of course, it's it's massively annoying for people who don't, don't live in Europe because they feel marginalised all of the time. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have a Mercator projection of the world with New Zealand or Zambia or or Ecuador in the middle of the map. It would work just as well. Let's let's um, stay stay with maps for a moment because I think it's really interesting to look at them through the prism of what it tells us about the culture that produced them. Um, and so I was thinking about OS maps, actually, and how, you know, how useful they are. And actually, how I mean, I love an OS map, all those, those things, it takes me takes me right back. But I was thinking, what does it, what, the symbols that are chosen to go on that OS map, what does it say about Britain? Um, and actually, what does it say about Britain today? So for example, the church symbols, do we really worry in contemporary Britain whether um, a church has a spire or whether it has a tower? Are we worried about where a post office is? We, we may well be worried where a public house is, uh, a pub is, but I wonder whether, you know, is, is there an argument for taking some of those symbols away and perhaps adding others? Um, well, I, that's, that's a really, really great question. Um, uh, I, I would say that we have to think about the permanence of structures. That's one issue. So uh, one, although the, the Ordnance Survey maps I grew up with were all printed on paper and, they're, and, and there are, you know, there were artifacts to keep often. I've kept all the ones I've ever owned. I'm, I'm ashamed to say I've got about a thousand Ordnance Survey maps upstairs. But, um, and I, I use them a lot, um, but you didn't kind of, they weren't like digital maps that could be updated every hour, whereas the Ordnance Survey now does have um, uh, a national digital map that can be updated on a daily basis. So, so I guess um, there might be an argument on digital mapping for putting, for example, mobile phone masts on, but mobile phone masts are always coming and going. Um, and uh, whereas a church spire is on the whole not going to go, once it's there, it's going to stay. And, and I'd also argue that actually um, and Northern Survey maps are, uh, it's only one of their uses, but they're a wonderful historical document. Um, and um, if you are going for a walk or a bike ride or a, or a drive through the countryside exploring, uh, then you can use these symbols like um, a church tower to navigate. Um, or you can, if you're going for a walk, um, using a 1 to 25,000 uh, scale ordnance survey map. If you're going, for, if you're going to try and cross Dartmoor, um, which is a notoriously difficult place to navigate across, you're really, you know, you're going to set off, and you mustn't do this unless you're very, very skilled at, at map and compass and dead reckoning. You're going to set off, and within about ten minutes, you're going to really be looking very closely at that OS map for those little spiky tufts, <laughs> which tell you <laughs> that you're going to probably sink up to your knees in water. So knowing where, um, I forget what the OS calls that, but bog or marsh probably, 
Um, so knowing where those are and where the, the solid ground is really matters if you're going for a walk. I mean, they are, when you think about it, the Ordnance Ord Ord Survey maps, to my mind, they are the best topographical maps in the world. But what we should think about with them is not so much what they've got on them, but how much has been left off them. And of course, you have to leave information off because otherwise they become so cluttered that you can't use them. They're not clear enough. And um, so the real trick with using an ordnance survey map, um, if you're using it for navigation, is to always ask yourself, OK, so what might be missing? You know, you're setting, you're walking across a, a mountain ridge and you've got the contour lines, you've got the rock outcrops marked. But there's a lot of things that won't be marked. You could easily have a, a, little, a short vertical drop um, that falls between the contour lines. It's certainly, you know, far enough to break your leg if you go over the edge of it. So it's not as if you can just use a map and walk around with your eyes shut. You've got to think about what, what's in the gaps. Um, but I, th I think, I'm sure, I mean, you'd have to ask the audience over, but I'm sure they do regularly review uh, topographical features that they're marking. Um, you know, and, and you can think of some of the obvious ones, like, you know, motorways that crisscrossing all of our maps these days, big blue, thick arterial lines. Um, but I, I'm, I, I can think of one that disappeared. Um, there used to be a symbol for military sites, um, I think, that were, or was they were they not shown? No, there was a... That's like there's a category of military sites that were not to be shown on ordnance survey maps. I think those have now appeared, but not identified. And I can remember many years ago when I, I walked in a straight line following a line of two degrees west longitude from the Scottish border to the English Channel, um, coming across at least one of these sites. I was you know, walking along with my compass dead straight line down the middle of England, and, uh, and then suddenly came across these, this massive set of <laughs> warehouses and barbed wire fences, absolutely nothing on that at all, just open fields. Um, and uh, so there are things that you won't find on the map that do exist on the ground. You mentioned the maps in your house, and I can imagine that you've got an absolute treasure trove there of books and maps, haven't you? I do. And um, in fact, this, let me show you this one, Julie. I got because, because I can do it because I'm sitting at home talking to you. This, I, I lifted off the shelf. This um, Stanford's treasure is called Europe. It was edited by Sir Andrew Ramsey, um, and it was given to my wife Annabelle and I as a wedding present by a very close friend, Chris Bradley. It was published in 1885 by Edward Stanford in Charing Cross Road. And um, it was a reminder, and it's got, look at this beautiful map. I mean, the, the, um, it was a reminder that Stanford's, here we are, here's, here's, here's Stanford's, look at that stunning map of the Mediterranean, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and isn't Stanford's, Stanford's always understood the value of geography um, right from the start. And this, this book is one of many they, they, they published um, and was the standard text on Europe. So it's got everything from uh, uh, um, uh, description of, of the Apennines, both physical and it, the role of the Apennines in, in classical history. Um, it's got alpine plants, it's got biogeography, human geography, it's got the Elbe running across Germany, the minerals of France, everything you should ever need to know about Europe is in this book. Um, and they really did understand it. And then I've got another book here I picked off the shelves too, so just going even further back, this is a book that I used when I was researching my Mercator book. It's called Tudor Geography, and it's by a very famous um, cartographic historian called E.G.R. Taylor. And um, the, this whole book is about the value of geography and its applications in, in the Tudor age. Um, so um, uh, there's a map of the habitable world. Not really recognisable, but there's E.G.R. Taylor's map of the habitable world. Um, and, um, uh, you know, geography, geography, stretches the whole way back from Stanford's modern shop in Covent Garden with all of its ordnance survey maps and, and, and books related to travel and so on, all the way back through time, you can track geography actually back into the age of hunting and gathering, because if we hadn't been innate geographers, we wouldn't have been able to find our way to food sources and shelter. So we were, we were mentally mapping 
long before we were reading and writing. So long before the age of formal mapping, we were, we were able to walk across the land bridge from the continent across what is now the North Sea into what is now Norfolk, and then set off on, on, onto this peninsula, this Northwest peninsula of Europe, looking for herds of auroch to hunt these gigantic wild cattle. And if we did find a herd of auroch, then we would have both memorized exactly where we found them and also created a mental mental map of that location so we could go back and find them. So we would have, we would have had to be drawing mental maps to find our way back to bivouac sites, to know where to find flint, which was the, the main source of, of raw material for, for weapons and tools. Um, so this idea that we that geography is new is erroneous. You know, it, it's it's with us. It's innate. We are all geographers. Always have been. There's a phrase that you use within the book, um, talking about landscapes and places being memory banks, um, and related to the stories that we tell ourselves. Yes, this is um, this is I I, I nicked a lot of ideas in the in the book from much more intelligent people than me. And, and this is something that came from two um, psychologists called Godman and Badley, who, who, um, who did some research on the way that memory works and, and, and were able to prove that uh, locations can be used as places to reboot our memories. Um, so that if you if you need to, if you need to remind yourself, for example, about um, uh, uh, members of your family or about family happenings or about something that happened in the past related to your family, then you're more likely to be able to rekindle that memory by being in the house where where those memories were rooted, or going to a picnic place where you're all together, or going back to a place where you're on holiday. So that's what Godman and Baden were arguing. Badly were arguing that actually. Um, you can you can rekindle memory, reboot it by going back to particular places. Now um, that of course raised some really interesting um, notions about the way the landscape works. So the reason I use a memory bank, it's rather like rather like using a landscape um, as 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 uh, 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 or, or rather um, imagining a landscape as if it's dotted with thousands and thousands of of personal servers that that are waiting for you to go back there. And then to provide you with this lost data, this lost information, um, and I, and, and as soon as I read their paper, and I was put onto it by my son Kit, who at the time was reading psychology at Sussex Uni, and he told me about Gordon and Badley, and I, as soon as I read it, it was just like a light switching on, because I realised how often I I've been doing exactly that. I go back to a place, often I'm not entirely sure why I've gone there, but as soon as I'm there, all of these memories just start crowding in. And the, the, one of the reasons that it fascinated me is that when I was researching um, a, a book I wrote called The Making of the British Landscape, um, I was wondering about places like Stonehenge and a lot of the, um, the standing stones, megaliths, tombs, the, the, the landscapes dotted with hundreds of thousands of, of prehistoric sites. And we don't know exactly how they were used because there's no written record. You know, the, the definition of prehistory is that there, there is no historical written record of, of what was going on. And, and actually prehistory in Britain lasted for, for, for the first 8,000 years or so of, of our 12,000 year occupation. And um, so it's a very long part of our, our story in Britain. And so perhaps you could, you know, I, I, I think it'd be foolish not to look at places like Stonehenge as if they weren't also uh, if you like, servers, memory banks, places that people are going back to to rekindle memories, not just acquaintances, probably with other people from other bits of Britain, but or causewayed enclosures, a very strange, uh, one of the earliest Neolithic landforms is in Britain. Um, not defensive because there were huge circular hem structures with a ditch and bank, but they had gaps around the perimeter. So people could come into them and leave them. Uh, what were they for? Um, there are many theories, but you know, I, I, I could imagine them being, um, I call them social enclosures in my book, I could imagine them being used as congregation places in the way that we might nowadays use Trafalgar Square or a church um, or the O2 centre, places where people came together and then shared something. Um, and one of the things they might have been sharing were memories. 
rebooting their memories because remember, there's no written, there's no paper, no pencils, there's no computers or laptops to record your your family's digital photos. It's all in your head. So there's that daily kind of attrition of memory going on in, in that, at that time. And one way of keeping it alive would be to go to these places where you could reboot it. It's um, almost everything changes, but nothing changes really, isn't it? Um, within that, that book, um, The Making of the British Landscape, one of the sort of themes that you um, explore is the tension between towns and countryside, which there has been for a long, long time. Yeah, it always has been. And, uh, and there always will be. And, um, you know, we, we, we went through a, a critical transition uh, not long ago to, to a world that's now mostly urban, um, uh, which of course has never happened before. You know, it's always been a mostly rural world, but uh, we're now in a mostly urban world. And, and that trend certainly in in Europe and in Britain is, is, is continuing to a more urban situation. And, um, and the tension, you know, and I speak as a, you know, city dweller is, you know, it's palpable, isn't it? You know, I, I, my, my, many of my family live in quite remote places outside London, and I kind of get this mirror image. I go go to see them, and I can see this show, well, what William Cobbett called the Great Wen, this disgusting, great big distant blob called London on the right. You know, that's out of sight but not out of mind. That's somehow full of all the evils of the world, um, and um, and yeah, I, I, I'm drawn to it by an incredibly strong magnetic urban field um, and fascinated by it as well and, and live in it. But um, I, I don't think there's any way of, of I, don't, I don't think there's any way of, of diluting attention, but I do think there's a way of cities becoming exemplars of, of sustainable communities. And I know we have rural and semi-rural communities that are that already, places like Totnes, you know, Britain's first transition town, which has shown brilliantly how um, relatively um, small, compact um, communities can can show the way. But when you're looking at cities of several million, it's much more complicated because somewhere like London is is a is a collection of hundreds, if not thousands, of top nesses all nudged up against each other. So it's much more complicated. So the systems have to be incredibly complex. What you do get in cities is this um, scaling effect where if you double the population, you don't need to double the number of gas stations. Um, uh, the, the American geographer worked out that, for example, in, I think he's looking at Los Angeles, if you double the population of Los Angeles, you only need 85% more gas stations to keep all of those people's vehicles fueled. So cities can offer a lot for the future in terms of the sustainability, because actually it creates a lesser impact on the planet for people to live in, in a connected city um uh city, city in, 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 a, in, a, in a city type community where food deliveries and uh, essentials can be uh undertaken in a very efficient way um but um you know i think it's part of the, it's part of the fascinating fabric of britain that, that we have both and um i mean i would go completely nuts if i couldn't imagine the countryside existing i'm going nuts i'm stuck in central london dreaming about you know the countryside and uh, uh and you know just desperate to go and climb a mountain um and uh so you know we all need both it would be it would be impossible to live in the countryside without the economic benefits of cities and the services provided by cities the two need each other you know they're interdependent so yeah the tension exists um i don't think it's always very productive um you know, it's it's, and you don't have to be one or the other. Person, I think we we, you know, country dwellers and city dwellers need each other, and they they need both landscapes. You know, it's the whole that matters. Um, and I think one of one of the things that struck me making um, all of the coast television programs going round and round the coast for ten years is that um, how how strong a sense of identity, how much, how much a sense of identity on an island is created by this, this cutoff caused by the coast. You know, we don't have, we don't have a permeable edge across which um, ideas and practices very easily transmit. You know, it's quite a defined 
edge. And therefore, you know, perhaps it's not surprising in Britain as islanders that we tend to stand with our backs to the sea looking inward and what we see is town and country. Um, I wonder, you know, I'd, I'd be fascinated to know whether town and country is such a big deal in, um, in a landlocked country like Switzerland. Very, yeah, very interesting to think about. Um, we are all locked in, locked down at the moment, um, which means that we have time. And I wonder whether um, either you're aware of what's being studied in geography departments at the moment around the country in relation to COVID and the pandemic, because if ever there was a time for geography, then um, you know, looking at the things that led to that and the way that we might get out of it and the interconnectedness and everything, it, it seems to be the moment. Or perhaps what you think should be being looked at by those geography departments in relation to what we're going through right now. I'm thinking in terms of poverty and equality, perhaps, um, and all of those things which are central to geography, but we're having a whole brand new case study and example of yeah, I, I think, and I and um, certainly two, two of our household are both doing uh, university degrees at the moment in international development from the kitchen or various spaces around this, this building. Um, so I'm kind of aware of what they're what they're working on, and um, it's too early. Um, but I, I'm not actually in the university department, so I can't say with any certainty. But I think it's too early for the for the pandemic to have crept in any. Uh, comprehensive way into, into curricula um, but you know international development is something that's been studied for a very long time and certainly if you look at the the UN sustainable development goals the list of 17 goals that um, were meant to be achieved by 2030 you know poverty inequality right up there um, and those are both two elements of the UN's SDG list that have been thrown into relief by the pandemic um, that poverty in, in, inequality appear to be factors in the in the, the density of transmission um and I'm, I'm, I'm sure these will be these will end up next year on on geography courses i think it's too early yet the, the stats are all so fresh aren't they you know but I, I it must be it must be a topic of conversation surely in in online teaching on that already but i'm, I'm afraid i i don't know um i maybe i want to eavesdrop more on the lectures going on <laughs> I'm just thinking that we're going to be inundated with PhD theories and therefore courses for the future on um, on the pandemic, a little bit like in, in um, other forms of literature. There will be COVID novels for the next five years. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's that's going to happen. I, I, I think there's a, you know, that I mean, I, I think there's a there's a shock element that we haven't yet taken on board. I mean, just today's uh, today's figures are so shocking uh, that I can't really even begin to imagine it. And I'm talking to somebody who's you know, lost both my parents in the last uh, 12 months or so, but the sheer scale of, of COVID-related deaths is now so enormous that it's incredibly difficult to imagine. And, um, uh, and I, that, that's going to take a really long time to sink in. And I, and I think it would be... You know, it's, it's, there's going to be. I think it's, there's going to be the immediate adjustment, which we're all making on a day by day basis, and then there's going to be about five years or whatever it might be from now. We're going to, you know, people have written papers. There will be the books, and I'll stand back from it. So, right, well, that was really something. And of course, it is. It's there's been nothing like this certainly in my lifetime, and you, you really have to go back in in the UK to the Second World War to find anything that's been as nationally catastrophic, um, and. Um, so it's uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 a, it's a huge one, and I think it's often the case. I've noticed this with expeditions. If I've been on a very difficult journey and everything's gone really hot, and I'm hanging on by the skin of my teeth on a, in a on a ridge with a tent blowing down, I'm on my own. I've got no communications, and I've got food run out, and you know there's a, a desperate situation. When it, when it's when it's when you're in the midst of it, and you and it's life or death. You're so preoccupied with getting through the next five minutes or hour, or sometimes you might make a plan for the rest of the night, uh, so that you know what to do when the sun rises or when it won't rise in the storm, when, when light returns. Actually, you're not. You're not. You when you're in the middle of it, you can't possibly have that longer view. Uh, so it's going to it's going to be a number of years before we have the long view on the pandemic. I'm certain of that. Mm, 
yeah makes sense of it well i'm glad you made it back from the edge of that ridge and the tent blowing away and so on um we can't let you go nick without asking you about that book which you referred to earlier earlier the one that you're delivering at the moment are you able to say anything about it uh, the content and and when it might be out yes it's coming out in may and um i, I was very lucky i was uh i was offered a uh a, an amazing project by uh michael joseph the part of penguin to write the story of the 1735 geodesic mission to the equator which is a uh, french and spanish expedition to measure the shape of the earth and you know as a writer you know what, what more could you ask for in the midst of a pandemic than a rip-roaring story um and i didn't have access to my favorite places the british library um or the london library the royal geographical society library so i've been sitting where I am talking to you, um, uh, writing this book using web sources and my own imagination. And um, and it's been a complete joy. I've loved it. It's been a massively <laughs> helpful distraction. Uh, so it's been published in May and by Michael Joseph. And um, I'm, I'm copy editing at the moment. So I'm, I'm a few days from handing it, handing it over. Yeah. It's going to be called Latitude um, because it's really at heart, it is the story um, of the of the discovery of latitude, the measuring of latitude. Yeah, I can't wait to read it. It's fantastic. So you'll have to come back to Stanford and tell us all about it next time. Promise. I absolutely promise. I would love to. I'd be thrilled. Fantastic. Well, listen, Nick. Thanks so much for being with us today. It's been an absolute treat to listen to your stories and for you to explain so comprehensively why geography matters. Um, thanks to everybody for watching and for being here. Um, do please go onto the, web the website, the Stanford's website, uh, when this book is available. Have a have an extra look there. Look at the blurb. Uh, pick it up metaphorically, as it were, and, and take a look around. Um, Nick. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your stories. Thanks for being with us. Um, and we wish you all the very best. Thank you, Julia. As ever, such a pleasure chatting. And, and good luck with the rest of the, the festival. I'm looking forward to logging on and being distracted by lots of wonderful travel books. As Julia said, what a treat for us all to see Nick Crane back on our virtual stage. Thank you to both of them. Uh, well, we heard that latitude isn't out yet, but why geography matters certainly is, and you can get your sanitised hands on it at stanfords.co.uk, together with no less than six of his other titles, including The Making of the British Landscape and Coast, Our Island Story. Our website is also where you too can follow in Nick's footsteps by logging on to our other events, and there are 23 of them to track down. So we'll see you very soon.